Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the invitation and for the very nice introduction. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about what we do in uh, with quantitative phase imaging. So this is a. Uh, I'm going to tell you what it means for those of you who are not that familiar, and uh, I'm going to show a couple of applications that we're actively working on in my lab, and uh, which is right here on the third floor. And please stop by and visit us sometime. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge the people who've been involved in this work from the beginning. And uh, you see here some people that already left uh, for better jobs. Uh, the highlighted people here are actually those who contributed most for, to this work in this slide. And uh, as is the case with most interdisciplinary work, we rely heavily on uh, collaborators, both from our kind of related fields, like Rashid here uh, from ECE, but also uh, on the biology side, Martha Gillette has been a great collaborator across campus on the neuroscience uh, measurements that we do. Supriya Prasant on uh, cell biology. Krishna Tangela, who is a, a pathologist across the street in Provina. And we also work with uh, people outside the campus, obviously. Uh, pathology at UCI in Chicago uh, is working with us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And we even work with the soft condensed matter physicists like Alex Levine from UCLA, who actually helps us making sense of our data. We, we have this funny problem that we generate a lot more data than we understand. I think uh, some people have the opposite problem, but uh, that's where we stand. So we could use all the help we, uh, uh, we can get. So here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to tell a little bit about the background and motivation, a little bit of a historical perspective. My plan is not to give you the latest things that we do in the lab, but mostly to give you a, a review of the uh, technology and more the principles of QPI in general. So I'm going to talk about that in, at point two here. I'm going to introduce some of uh, uh, a little bit of the older technique that we used, uh, especially for red blood cell dynamics. And then the rest of the talk will be about something that we developed here in Beckman. Uh, we call it SLIM. It's a new method for quantitative phase imaging. And how we use it for cell growth intracellular mass transport and cancer diagnosis. So i like to start most of my talk with this slide because this is the first recorded uh, report on imaging bacteria and imaging red blood cells in, in the 1680s. And uh, you can tell how slow our progress is with these things because we're still kind of working on this. And I'm going to show you both E. coli and the red blood cells today. Uh, so by the way, these are uh, early reports on microscopy, early developments on microscopy are mostly due to the Dutch. And uh, Van Leeuwenhoek is uh, uh, considered the father of cell biology. So here's the problem, and maybe the reason why the progress is not as fast as we would hope, is that basically the cells are very transparent. So this is how a neuron looks like in a bright field microscope of the kind that we had back in the 17th century. There isn't much to see, really. So it took about 350 years to go from this one to this one. And this is a phase contrast image of the same thing. And it was such a great invention that actually received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1953. Again, a Dutch person, Fritz uh, He developed it in the 30s, but it took a while for people to understand how, how great this was. And basically, it's safe to say that any biology lab has a phase contrast microscope now. I think that that's largely true for everywhere in the world. The reason is that you can actually see stuff inside the cells without uh, staining them or adding them, tagging them with chlorophores and so on. So what is the idea behind these methods? And by the way, DIT or differential interference contrast is another related method that kind of uh, is the same idea of generating intrinsic contrast. Uh, that means without adding any contrast. Either. So the idea is this, that if you pass, let's say, this plane width, this a uh, collimated beam passes through the cell, uh, even though it doesn't absorb much, so from, you know, if you want to look at the field here, the amplitude doesn't get modulated much. Um, uh, it actually, the wavefront gets distorted, meaning there is a lot of changes in the phase of the field. Okay, so there are ripples in the wavefront, even though the amplitude tells you nothing. So if you just look at the amplitude, you take a picture of it with the camera, which is only sensitive to intensity, that's why you see nothing. You see small contrast. So if somehow we manage to get this information back into the intensity somehow, 
then uh, we would get intrinsic contractivity. And that's what Fritz Zernicke did. And what this is what the IC does. Uh, however, th these, both of these techniques actually have limitations in the sense that they can never tell you how much this bending in the wavefront is. How much is this phase delay? They're qualitative. They give you a nice image, you look at it, but you cannot do measurements. And I think we all agree that now biomedicine is stepping into this new era where actually we go from an empirical kind of all observation-based uh, science to something that's more quantitative. That explains why so many of us in engineering and physics kind of are working on this problem. So that's what we're, we've been trying to fix for the past. I've been working on this for the past 10 years now. I just realized that as a postdoc, I started on this. So it's been 10 years already. Uh, again, slow progress. So we want to go not only from uh, bright field, low contrast, to something with high contrast, but actually we want to put numbers at each point in the image. We want to quantify how much that phase shift is. So something like this. Add, add a color bar that means something. That's what we mean by quantitative phase imaging. So phase imaging is kind of clear now. Quantitative means really measuring that phase shift at each point. And we said this goal is to quantify the phase shift with nanometer path length sensitivity, means lambda over 1,000. So if there is a delay that is 1,000th of that wavelength, we want to measure that. And I'm going to sh show you later why that's important. This adds incredible constraints on your optics, on how stable the whole thing has to be. For comparison, if you're breathing on top of your optical table, you introduce many, many thousands of nanometers of noise. OK, so the information is gone. And of course, we want to do this without adding anything to the cells. Just uh, watch them without tagging them or adding contrast agents without disturbing them much. Uh, you can think of this getting to the nanoscale. It's as if you're combining an AFM or SEM, which is great in terms of quantitative and nanoscale features, uh, but not so great in terms of how happy the cell is. It's long since dead, right? In SEM, you actually put in a high vacuum and throw some metal on top of it. Uh, we want to combine this feature with actually the, the idea of light imaging that is so non-invasive and kind of friendly by comparison. So we want to combine, have a method that's both quantitative and dynamic. So first, you may wonder what is this phase stuff or this phase concept, which is uh, something to do with the electromagnetic, electromagnetic field. Why is that relevant to biology anyway? Right? And here's why. If you pass this light again, you pass through the cell, and let's say in the first approximation, the cell is a homogeneous blob that has a refractive index n, sitting in an environment of refractive index n not. That's a culture medium, let's say. Um, if you plot the phase, actually the wavefront is bent the other way, right? It's delayed in the cell. Uh, but if you plot the phase shift itself, you get something that is proportional to the refractive index contrast, this minus this, times the thickness of the cell. So if you're able to measure this, phase with very high accuracy, meaning, let's say, milliradians, then you are able to tell something about the size, the thickness of the cell, down to the nanoscale, back to the SCF. Uh, on the other hand, if you are able to, to do the same measurement, milliradian, uh, let's say, accuracy, you'll be able to tell something with 10 to minus 4 or 5 in terms of refractive index change. And I'm going to show you that actually refractive index is nothing more but density of the cell. So it takes only a handful of molecules arranged differently or having a local concentration that's different at one point versus the other. Uh, that will generate a measurable phase delay. So basically, this abstract concept of phase that relates to an optical field is relevant to biology because it gives you information about size and gives you information about cell content or <laughs> concentration. And I'm going to talk about that. It gets really interesting if you look at fluctuations of the phase. And the reason is that if you look at the first order uh, expansion here, the fluctuations in the phase have two components, right? One, fluctuations in thickness at constant refractive index. And what does that mean? It means that if you have a cell that now uh, has a membrane that actually has ripples, fluctuates, and uh, it, it happens, we're lucky that it happens that these fluctuations are much faster than any transport in the cell, meaning I can really consider, if I measure fast enough, I can really consider that the refractive index is constant while the ripples are fluctuating. That gives you fluctuations in the membrane. The more the membrane fluctuates, you can tell that the floppier the cell is, right? The more kind of, uh, the softer the cell is. So that again becomes biologically relevant. And you have the second component that basically, if you measure slower now, you average these ripples out, and then you are sensitive only to these particles going in plane, left and right. 
So the first one gives you all the plane fluctuations of the membrane at constant refractive index. The other one gives you fluctuations in plane, so particles moving, mass transported at constant p. So I'm going to tell you how actually we, we, we uh, use both of these. So I'm a true believer in this. I devoted, as I said, 10 years uh, in this field. And I, I, I am biased, I have to say. I really believe this is the next big thing in biology. <laughs> And I took the time to kind of summarize this. Basically, we combine light microscopy with holography. And this is the, a little review that I put together. So hopefully, we'll get more people interested in it. But this is just to tell you up front that I'm really biased about it. <laughs> so <coughs> the intensity that you measure in any interference, first of all, to get to the phase uh, of a field, you actually uh, without getting too technical about it, you can never actually measure the phase of a field, optical field. You, can, you only have access to differences in phases. Technically speaking, means that we can never measure a field itself, but we only measure correlations. So what we do usually, we have a field that goes through the sample, and we call that the object field, and we have one that we call reference that doesn't go through the sample. And then you put the two together and you look at the differences. No matter how you do that, it will look the intensity, so the modulus square of that sum, it will look something like this. It will have the intensity of the image, the modulus square of that image, field, the intensity of the reference, and then the interesting part, which is the cross term. So here you have two options. In other words, you have two classes of methods for measuring this phase information. Remember, we are after this phase right here, the phase difference between the two. So you can do what is called phase shifting, meaning you can add the modulation in time domain between the two. So you have a reference, and somehow you manage to control the phase of that with respect to the object. <coughs> and that's shown right here. Imagine you have a black box, a microscope, or an imaging system that takes this sample field projected <coughs> on the CCD. And now I come with a reference, something like that. And I have control over the phase shift of this reference. And that's what I'm showing here. Omega is the average frequency of that. And T minus TR is the phase shift. This is called phase shifting interferometry. But I can have actually another one, another option, totally different class of measurements, where actually I'm doing the modulation in space. Essentially, you need to tilt one of the beams, so the reference here comes at a certain angle. There is actually an offset between the directions of the two k vectors, right? So you have the average k vector of the image field, that is something pointing this way, and then you come with the reference at a certain angle, and you get spatial fringes. One is time, one is spatial modulation. We call this all factors because they are all facts. So no matter how you do it, the problem is that there is noise in here. On top of these terms here, you have an argument, a noisy term in that argument that is due to air fluctuations or vibrations and so on. This is the same problem that actually Michelson and Morley faced more than 100 years ago. And I, I assume most of you know what that experiment was about, was trying to find the existence of ether was the most famous kind of negative outcome experiment. But look what they had to say. This is their interferometer. <laughs> they had the, something like a ton, a block of stone on top of a mercury bat. I don't know how biosafety worked back then. But they had to actually rotate the thing over two directions. That was the Michelson and Morley experiment. But look what they had to say about the noise. In the first experiment, one of the principal difficulties they encountered was its extreme, the system's extreme sensitivity to vibration. It was so great that it was impossible to see the interference fringes, except at brief intervals when working in the city, even at 2 o'clock in the morning. And this is very kind of interesting to me, because we were doing, as an undergrad in Romania, as Scott mentioned, we were doing holography labs. And we had to wait for the buses to stop. <laughs> kind of. Anyway, so same problem. You see, 100 years later, we're facing the same problem. So I kind of, I, I told you I put some time into summarizing the field and hopefully help more people get into the field. And I came up with this little table that actually, I think summarizes what exactly we're trying to do with these methods and why are there so many of them. Because if you read Optics Journal, you'll see that there are so many variations of these little methods that it's easy to get confused. So there are four features uh, that I think are most important for a quantity phase imaging system. One is acquisition rate, how much, how fast, how many frames per second can you get out of it? <coughs> how fast you can sample in the spatial domain, transverse resolution, so how many dots, right? What's the smallest distance between two points considered result? And then these two 
The first two are actually common to any imaging system, but the, the last two are particular to the QPI. Temporal sensitivity of the phase, meaning if I measure a succession in time, what's the smallest phase bump that I can detect in time, right? Spatially, what is the smallest phase step? If you give me, let's say, I don't know, graphene, can I measure that? Half a nanometer step. So on the Y column right here, you see that actually there are methods or approaches that satisfy one of these intrinsically. Meaning, if I do off-axis the way I showed you earlier, it turns out you can get a phase image out of one measurement. That means if you pay the money to get a fast ECD, you will get fast acquisition rate. There's no other delay involved. Uh, for transverse resolution, it turns out that phase shifting, the first method that I showed you, gives better results because uh, the first one actually requires some numerics, some Fourier transforms back and forth that may actually uh, wash off some resolution. You can, if you are careful, you don't. But intrinsically, phase shifting gives you perfect transverse resolution, diffraction limited. And then these last two, the temporal sensitivity is ensured if you manage that the interferometer is common path. If you manage to make an interferometer where the two beams are actually as close as possible on top of one another. Why? Because then they are going to see the same noise. And when you do the cross term, that noise will disappear. So common path gives you temporal sensitivity. Finally, spatial sensitivity turns out to be better with white light than with lasers because of the speckle uh, pattern that the lasers make. Essentially, lasers are too coherent. If you look at something like this, you zoom in there, you are going to see dots. It's a random interference pattern that actually turns to work out the quality of your image. So basically, I'm going to tell you about two methods, one laser one that we developed back when I was a postdoc, and now the white light that I think I'm going to show you is much better that we developed here at Beckman. So back to the question as to why there are so many methods out there published now every week, which makes me happy on the one hand, but adds the confusion on the other hand, is that you combine two of these. So you can get one of axis with common path, which is what we also do. So if you combine two out of four, you get six methods. If you combine Groups of three, you get four more. And of course, it's kind of silly, but you can even combine all of them. So you see, back when I wrote this, there was one that wasn't published. If you get off axis space shifting and wild light, that wasn't published. But that's no longer the case. So a few months ago, that got published. So let me tell you something about one off axis and common path. So this is a fast and phase sensitive method, because it's common path. We call that diffraction phase microscopy. And let me tell you quickly how it works. It's using a laser. This is a, an inverted microscope, kind of off the shelf. So you buy it from Zeiss or whatever. And then, basically, at the image plane where all the kind of a regular biology user will place a camera and get it over with, that's where we kind of start. So first of all, we have two lenses to magnify this image. Just it's a sampling problem that we have to take care of. But you can ignore this whole thing. We can start here. At the image plane, we place a gradient perfectly aligned to the image plane, such that we obtain this kind of split, a split in the wave, we wave right? so we have different diffraction orders, and out of which we only care about two. Meaning that somewhere in the back focal plane of this first lens, we block all the others. We only see two of them. So you see, essentially, right away, you can see the idea that actually we are generating a very, very tight interferometer. One beam goes this way, the other beam goes this way. So for that, I have a lens that actually has this great ability to do Fourier transform. So the field here is Fourier transform the focal distance away from this lens right here, meaning that the light that goes scatters forward through the image, it's actually the DC. It will be focused right here. That's the zero frequency. And then I have the second image. I do a Fourier transform another one, and I get back my original image. So this is a very, very tight interferometer. That's a common path interferometer, as opposed to Michelson inter Michelson's interferometer, where you had two beams going over a totally different path and then put them together. They will acquire very uncorrelated noise that will destroy your measurement. In this case, they go through the same set of optics. It's very stable. The phase relationship is actually stable. The only thing is that both of these went through the sample. So which one is the reference? Which one is the object, you may ask? And basically, we take one of them and low-pass filter it. We take this beam and pass it through a tiny pinhole to remove all the high frequency components. So after this pinhole, this, we show it in red that now it's kind of a different field that kind of forgot that it went through this sample ever. So this becomes a plane wave that comes on top of the original one. 
So this green one gives you the perfect image that st we started with of the microscope. But now the second one is now approaching a plane where it comes at an angle. And not only that, it's actually locked in phase with the first one. So that information is actually locked. Essentially, we're imaging the grating, you see. So if you think any image is an interfer interferogram, the reason, if you look at an image in our, your digital camera, the reason it's not fluctuating, even though it has phase information in it, it's exactly because it's going through the same set of optics. Any imaging is a common path interferometer. That's kind of the idea. Long story short, after we went through all kinds of problems, we tried to get rid of the noise in many different ways with the rack of electronics this big and so on. This method actually allowed us for the first time to do more serious biological measurements like this. So you look at the red blood cell that's about 8 micron in diameter and 2.5 and microns thick. And it turns out it's fluctuating on a nanoscale going up and down with an RMS of, I don't know, 30 nanometers. So this is basically a quantitative phase image. And we can do it very fast, 100 frames a second, as fast as your CCD. And it's sensitive, meaning this background is very stable, because of the two beams being actually on top of one another. It turns out that this is very important to be able to measure these fluctuations. These are largely Brownian, uh, it's, it's a thermal motion, Brownian motion. Uh, so if you use some smart modeling, and that's where we coupled with Alex Levine from UCLA, you can actually back up the mechanical properties of the membrane. And that is really important, because uh, elasticity of our red blood cells is actually what keeps us alive, what allows oxygen to be delivered is in microvasculature, like in our brain. It's kind of funny that our brain has micro vessels that are half the diameter of the red blood cell. So the poor red blood cell has to squeeze and then bounce back. Squeeze and bounce back. And I was very kind of excited when I learned that actually the way you make sure the red blood cells keep their elasticity fresh is to, by using the splint. So basically, they are forced to go through this splint. This is an electron micrograph that my wife acquired a few years ago. Uh, I didn't mention this. We published a few papers on red blood cells and then got married. That's how you do it. <laughs> uh, so basically, the red blood cells are forced to go through capillaries. <laughs> Uh, so they have to put up with a lot of stress, like this, if, uh, and then bounce back on the other side. If they get stuck here, if they get too stiff, the macrophages come in and really destroy them. So we have only 100 days old red blood cells in our circulation, something like that. So now, being able to measure these fluctuations optically without touching them, disturbing them, it will be able to predict you know, mechanical properties and how good they are from a functional point of view. So that's what we... That was the motivation for doing all those red blood cell measurements. Uh, we found some new physics in the process and so on. This is all kind of uh, more older stuff. But we published a number of papers. The idea, the bottom line is this, that with, the, with Alex's uh, model, we're able to get bending modules, shear modules of the membrane, and so on, predict all these biophysical properties uh, without touching the red blood cell. Okay. The alternative techniques is to put an atomic force microscope and kind of sense that motion, which is, as you can imagine, you can do it in one point. It's, it's kind of messy and so on. Um, but really, I want to move on to the newer stuff. And uh, basically, <coughs> moving to Urbana, when, when I came here in 07, the problem with the, this method was that this is how a neuron looks like with the laser. So compared to a phase contract. So you see a lot more detail here. This is kind of quantitative and so on. The colors mean something. But really, the details are terrible. You cannot see much in, inside these uh, subcellular structures here compared to this. So we needed to do something to actually not make a method that's quantitative and dynamic. We kind of did that, but actually speckle-free. And what we did upstairs was to, was to throw away all the lasers and go back to the white light, go back to halogen lamps and uh, something like that. So we took, again, the idea is to take an existing microscope. And again, I'm skipping a lot of steps here, because when I started to work on this, we were building our microscope from scratch, like a real hardcore optic person. And then you realize that actually there is a reason to use a Zeiss or Nikon or whatever microscope, because they're kind of nice. You'll never get it as nice as that. And plus, you have all these accessories and so on. So we did that uh, in the previous method, but remember, I had the laser coming through. Now we don't have even that. So this uses the halogen lamp that is used for phase contrast that comes with the microscope. And uh, just a minute ago, I was teaching phase contrast in the EC 460 class. That's why I was late a little bit. So basically, to summarize my class was that, uh, to tell you how the phase contrast works, 
The idea is to, again, treat the image as an interference process between this directed light, the light that goes through the sample on scatter. So this is the specimen right here. This is the DC. Uh, the illumination is over a ring, so the DC is now uh, kind of distributed over a ring. But basically, that focus point is the DC component, the unscattered light that goes through the sample. And the problem is this, that if you want a high contrast image, uh, the obstacle is that the interferogram has a, is a cosine function, which around zero is actually very slowly varying. As you know, a cosine is about 1 minus x squared over 2, right? It's a quadratic function of x, of the argument. That's not good. So the Nobel Prize in Physics 1953 went to going from a cosine to a sine. If you manage to add a pi over two phase shift in that argument, you make a cosine that actually is lazier on the origin to a sine that's actually linear at the origin. So how do you do that? Well, in this back focal plane of this objective, so right in this plane, you add a phase shifter, a film that actually shifts the phase precisely by pi over two, makes a cosine into a sine. Another thing, when you do interferometry, what? Uh, another condition to get best contrast is to make the powers in the two interfer in, uh, in the two interfering beams equal. So actually, if you put actually a film made of metal and you choose it properly, you can actually have a phase shift of pi over two while attenuating a lot of this light. As you can imagine in a transparent stuff, the light that goes through is a lot stronger than the light that scatters. So the cells are weakly scattered. So basically, that's how the phase contrast mic microscope works. If you hold in the in the light of phase, con uh, phase contrast objective, you are going to see this ring. That's exactly what it does. Phase shift and attenuate. Anyway, as I mentioned, the image is actually an intensity distribution that's qualitative in terms of that phase. It's high contrast, but you cannot do measurement. So if uh, our idea was this, how about I gain control over that phase shift? And instead of just having fixed that pi over 2, I add another pi over 2 and another pi over 2 and 0, and do four measurements like this. Combine all four. Basically, if you look at the interferogram equation, you have four. Uh, you have two intensities as unknown and the phase as another unknown. And as you know from trigonometry, the phase, uh, like our tangent and something like that, is only bijective of half a circle. So the phase counts as two variables, basically. If you want the phase over the entire circle, circle, you need two measurements. So essentially, you need four measurements to get the phase uniquely defined over the entire trigonometric circle. So that's what we did. We image this back focal plane of the objective onto a liquid crystal modulator. This is a spatial light modulator like the kind in some projectors. I'm not sure if this is the case. Uh, we match that ring perfectly on the liquid crystal. And now this, we have a control on the phase delay over that ring with respect to the background. Now, the light reflects off, goes through this other Fourier transform. This is a beam splitter. And basically, at the CCD, you have the image back. Without any modulation here, this acts as a mirror. You get your image back exactly what comes out of the phase contrast. But now if you add pi over 2 and pi and pi over 2, you take four measurements, combine them in a proper way, and you end up with this. So now, not only do we have very high contrast compared to the neuron a minute ago, if you remember, with this ugly thing. So there is no competition there. But actually, we're able to add these numbers. These are nanometers in terms of path length shift. That is actually very, very sensitive because it's common path. Now we're interfering this unscattered light with the light that actually is scattered, that is distributed over this plane. So again, it's very, very sensitive in time, but it's also sensitive in space because there is no spec, uh, spec of it. All right. So this is a background with a laser. This is a background with white light. First, we wanted to test how good the measurement was in terms of accuracy. So we compared from John Rogers' lab. They gave us a kind of a grating made of carbon film of about four nanometer steps. So this is what they imaged in AFM. This is what we image in SLIM. And this is basically a histogram. <coughs> Whoa. Uh, so basically, they match within a fraction of a nanometer, which is, turns out to be our noise. So if you look at the uh, distribution of the noise measuring nothing, you get a Gaussian of about 0.3 nanometers width. So that's the standard deviation of our noise. So that's the agreement level. Makes me happy to tell you that it took them 20 minutes to measure this little corner. It took us half a second to measure this whole thing. But of course, AFM can actually measure smaller details in X and Y than, uh, than light, right? We're still diffraction limited on X and Y. We're very good on Z, uh, while AFM is not diffraction limited. So that's to be completely fair. Um, 
So basically, spatially 0.3 nanometers. Temporally, actually, it's an order of magnitude better, even. The reason is that these interfering beams are this component with this component. They're as common paths as they can get. They are on top of one another. They see the same noise. So basically, we have 0.3 actions, 0.03 nanometer standard deviation. Again, measuring nothing in time. Many, many frames. Look at the standard deviation. It's very, very tight. So essentially, in my little table, we accomplish these three. So talk about people who combine many different things. So it's a phase shifting method, common path, as I mentioned, and white light. So it gives you everything except that you give away acquisition rate, because we need to acquire four images for each measurement. But actually, you can get a fast enough liquid crystal modulator, which is we did up, upstairs. So speed is not uh, such a crucial issue. Um, so in terms of uh, other features, you can actually, this image comes combined or overlaid with any channel in the microscope, fluorescence, DICU, you name it. So for instance, here you see in red, it's our face, it's our slip. You see these little dots correspond to where the neurons actually make connections. And then you can get, without any numerical alignment or anything, the fluorescence channels just show up there because it's the same optical path. We didn't change anything. So this is actually uh, important for doing serious biology, as you all know, better than me. And uh, another thing is that our microscope looks like this. Uh, I mean, this is not a commercial for dice. It could be a Nikon or whatever. but. Uh, the idea is that if you do it from scratch, you, it will be very hard to actually add all this stuff, temperature control, humidity, CO2, and so on. And this is really needed when you want to image cells and understand something. So basically, long story short, we can measure something like this. Uh, our nanometer stability, sub-nanometer stability level, here is tested to last over a week. So you're looking at the field of view. We went a little crazy here, actually, with tile. 5 by 5 fields of view over a week. And as you can tell, the cells are very happy multiplying. Uh, there is no, this is visible light, very low power compared to confocal. One reviewer asked us to compare with confocal. We're very happy. We found that it's a million times lower than confocal. The reason is that in confocal, you put all the light in one spot, while here you spread it everywhere. Uh, and it's visible. It's not UV like in fluorescence. So the cells are actually very happy. You can actually look at population level stuff. Or you can zoom in into details in a single uh, cell. So these are uh, U2OS cells. Uh, so you see all these dynamic stuff. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it and a little bit of uh, details inside the cell, things that we couldn't do with the laser. So first, let me tell you, we, we are kind of approaching many different applications, but I'm going to tell you about a couple. So one, cell growth. And that's what uh, Mustafa has been working on. Uh, over the past uh, couple of years or so. So it is said to be one of the last big problems that remains unsolved in biology. Simply stated, we don't really know how uh, cells grow. Or even more complicated, what are the processes that actually control the growth? What keeps uh, the equilibrium in the cell? And we think that the reason is, uh, one specific question is, is the growth exponential or linear in time? So it's very simple. It turns out these are not they don't have uh, established answers completely yet. So the problem is that the cells are very small. So they weigh about picograms of that order, maybe tens, maybe hundreds of picograms, but not much more than that. There is no scale you can put the cell on. And the other thing is kind of a dynamic range issue. The cell is not growing a 1,000 times and then dividing. It's only growing a factor of two and then dividing. So you need to kind of work within that range there. Uh, by the way, this is one picogram, a micron cube of water. So we're talking about very, very small masses. So motivated by this, uh, there has been a, a, a number of methods developed. Traditionally, people used volumes as mass. They said the density is the same. Who cares? We're going to just uh, have a through an impedance measurement to kind of get the volume with the cell counter, which is fine for E. coli like this. So fluorescence also it gives you the shape. If you assume it's a perfect cylinder, then you can kind of get the volume and then say the density doesn't matter again. But of course, these are approximations. But uh, at MIT, um, uh, they developed a, a method where actually it's kind of cool. You flow cells in a cantilever that actually vibrates at the resonant frequency like this. You have a channel through it. And when the cell passes through, it's actually changing slightly the mass. And therefore, the, uh, the resonant frequency shifts a little bit. So you measure that resonant frequency shift, and you can get the mass out. 
But of course, the problem with this is that the cell can never get stuck in there. Which is, and this is kind of mo what most cells like to do, to actually attach to the bottom and start growing. You cannot do that here. There's a number of cells you can actually don't attach, so that's OK. So our own Rashid Bashir here in MNTL, they tried to fix this by actually having a vibrating pedestal. So now the cells can actually attach the bottom, grow happily, and then you vibrate the whole thing. Uh, the whole thing becomes a little bulkier, so you give away a little bit of sensitivity. But anyway, this is work in progress, and it's actually challenging to do. Um, so we think that actually QPI is an even better method, or at least can compete for that spot, because you can actually measure adherent and non-adherent cells over long time. You don't need to circulate or anything like that. Uh, but you may ask, what's the relationship between the phase and mass, right? Well, it turns out we published a paper a few years ago where we looked at the following effect. Imagine you have a cell that actually is uh, uh, out, water is coming out of the cell. Okay? So there are two things that happen. The water going out, the volume goes down, the phase, phase shift turns to go, uh, tends to go down. But there's another thing that happens. When you take water out of the cell, the inside is more concentrated. The refractive index actually gets higher. So there are two competing effects, and we did the calculation, and actually turns out that they cancel in the first order. Meaning that for small changes in volume, let's say up to 10%, this will be a relative volume change. If you integrate this whole surface, you get a constant. And actually, we did the measurements to measure to, to see that. So this is great. It means that basically the phase shift is not sensitive to water coming in and out of the cell. It's fundamentally due to the fact that you measure this phase shift with respect to the light that went through the water already. That doesn't go through the cell, but goes through the culture medium. So that's why it makes sense that actually this is the result. Anyway, the concept is goes back to the 50s, but I think for the first time we kind of had a little bit of theory that explains it. So long story short, we can do measurements like this. So this is basically weighing an E. coli cell, and this is what Mustafa has uh, been measuring. We use the E. coli kind of like beads. In the sense, we use them as standard samples. People really agree that the, the growth should be exponential. They kind of know how they grow. And we just use them to kind of uh, see if we get uh, the expected result. So you see, if you're wondering uh, how much uh, the E. coli weighs, it's about a couple of picograms. And compared to these uh, kind of cantilever measurements, of course, it's uh, kind of nice that you can measure the, the daughter cells. So it splits here, and then you can watch them both grow, and you can look at the next generations, and so on and so on. Uh, it turns out that optically, we would be sensitive to about a couple of femtograms of mass if, if the, the culture medium was perfectly clean. But if, when we did a measurement on a fixed E. coli that doesn't grow, obviously, we, we pick up noise from the fragments of cells and so on. So it turns out that we're actually only 20 femtograms sensitivity per uh, micron square. But it's still big enough, I mean, sensitive enough that we can do actual measurements. Uh, we're able to show that if you do uh, the growth rate versus mass, you get a line. So meaning the bigger the cell is, the faster it grows. That translates into exponential growth. So we're able to recover the known results. So people know that E. coli grow exponentially. What we really wanted to do, though, after we established that we know what we're doing, was to look at the mammalian cells, so complicated cells. That's where we worked with Supriya Prasad, whose name should have been here. And uh, they gave us a marker for the S phase of the cell cycle. So it's the phase of the cell cycle where this fluorescent marker actually becomes most discrete. So if you know the S phase, you know the M when the cell actually physically uh, divides. So we're able to tell the, all the phases of the cell cycle. And in parallel, do the mass measurements. As I mentioned, fluorescence and the slim image is there on top of one another. So you do both simultaneously, and we're able to get growth curves for each cell, for each phase of the cell cycle. And that's something that is really impossible, as far as we know, with any other method. And what we found is that actually, there is a long story here. But basically, bottom line is this is the first time when we can actually combine this with fluorescence and measure how cells grow over. Uh, each of the phase cycle. But uh, we found that actually the, the uh, fastest growth is in G2, which is surprising. I mean, in a way, people don't really know what to expect. But uh, this was one result that we need to see if it's universal for all the cells or not. Uh, but anyway, this is a tool that now can be used in biology for, for deeper studies. And we are, for instance, uh, working on uh, cancer cell models on, uh, for breast cancer. Stop is doing experiments as we speak. Another question is, 
kind of, when you do just mass measurements, you're throwing away most of the data, right? You integrate the whole image and you get one number out of it per frame. What if we look now at the whole field of view and try to understand how the mass is moving around? So I want you to picture this not as a, actually an image, but as a mass density. It's a map of density. Where it's more red, it means the stuff is denser. There's more stuff. Where it's blue, it's less stuff. So we have a movie of this, meaning we, we resolve this both in space and in time. The question is, can we understand how this is moving around? And the answer should be yes, because I have all the information I need. It's just a matter of coming up with a certain model that uh, explains it. And uh, uh, here, what I'm trying to show here is that even though it looks like bluish and no details here, it's just because the RGB color doesn't capture everything. With our signal to noise is about 1,000 here. So if you zoom in and you adjust the colors, you see a bunch of stuff. You take derivatives and you see actually that the signal, okay, this is already compressed. But you see there, there is a lot of signal here, even though the colors don't show it. So here's what we did. We tried to wear optics people who so are biased by the dispersion relation, which we always, that answers all our question when we have to propagate something in a waveguide or something like that. The dispersion relation is what relates the spatial scale with the temporal scale. So basically, we did the same thing here. You take the data 3D, x, y, and time, take the Fourier transform in all three dimensions, and you look at the frequency domain. As you know, roughly, kind of nature played the trick on us that we're equipped with space and time detectors, but actually the laws of physics are nicely written in the frequency domain. That's what the dispersion relation is. So this is a Fourier transform of this image in X and Y. And if you take now the Fourier transform in time and at each point you measure the bandwidth, you have now the bandwidth versus spatial frequency that actually looks like this. So it gives you if you now plot, let's say, a profile through this, you'll get a graph that looks kind of like this. So you have, basically, this is a bandwidth. This tells you kind of, so this is inverse time. The one over this bandwidth will give you a decay time. Okay, it's almost like a lifetime in fluorescence, the equivalent of that. Except that here it means, what is, it takes one over delta omega on average for particles to travel one over Q. So, one, so this is inverse space, this is inverse time. As I said, nature played the trick on us. It looks nice in the frequency domain, in time domain, all becomes a convolution and it's not as nice to look at. Basically, if you get, uh, if you get a linear uh, curve in this plot, it tells you that the transport is directed. It's as if the cell takes a bus and moves at constant speed, or the particle rides on top of a microtubule or on top of actin. If you get Q squared, that's the sign of diffusion. This is what uh, people would measure in dynamic light scattering. Anyways, we got both. I skipped a lot of introduction where we measure particles in Brownian motion, where you only get the diffusive part. But in live cells, it turns out, and by the way, this is Ru Wang's thesis, who's right here getting ready to graduate. We're very surprised to get a universal behavior like this. It's always Q at small q, mean, meaning large distances, and diffusive at large q or tiny distances. So it means that the cell over small dif distances transport is actually effectively done by diffusion. And it has the advantage that diffusion comes for free. Right? The cell doesn't need to eat or doesn't need to consume energy to move stuff around. But when the cell needs to send a particle from the nucleus, let's say, or vesicle from the nucleus to five microns away, he has to consume energy, he has to consume ATP, he has to use molecular motors, and that's what this one shows right here. So this is very, very interesting to us. That basically, this is a universal behavior in all the cells, except that in neurons along dendrite, this is deterministic all the way. Neurons don't have time for diffusion, basically. So anyway, to me, this is interesting. You can even talk, uh, I don't know, philosophy, religion, if you want. One is God given right here, one is the free will right here. On the <laughs> So uh, uh, I'm going to uh, just tell you what we're trying to do now, try to understand with this uh, idea of dispersion relations in transport. And basically, we're looking at uh, neural differentiation. And these are some movies that now uh, Mustafa is getting ready for publication. So we looked at progenitor cells, neuron progenitor cells, differentiating before our eyes over almost two weeks or 12 days. So they start like this, nothing like neurons. OK, these are slim images. Day three, you can kind of start to see that lamellopodia are getting thinner and so on. Day five, 
they get thinner, right? You, they start to look something that look like neurons. Now, 11 days, they really become something that uh, we recognize. But eventually, they start to form networks, and they look like that. So this is just taking a movie over two weeks, doing it, not doing anything, just uh, let slim image. This will be very hard to do with another method like confocal, because before they do this, they will, they're going to die. So we're trying to understand now in the dynamics, and our result, preliminary results are actually pretty uh, very interesting, that it shows clearly how the transport becomes deterministic as, as time goes by. So in particular, we looked at this kind of data when they are now differentiated, but they are forming networks. This is another interesting problem for us, and that's where we collaborate with Martha Gillette and uh, uh, Chris and uh, Mustafa are kind of investigating this from all different angles. So basically, you can do the dispersion analysis that I mentioned at this large scale. And we, we find that, actually, you can tell in time over 24 hours, for instance, we found that they grow and then they stop growing. So they make material that allows them to connect one another, but then they stop. And they, they consume energy just for making connections. And, and all this shows up in our graphs, basically. So that's kind of nice. Anyway, we stare at this kind of movies every day for pretty much that's what we do half of the time. Uh, but really, we want to go beyond this and try to understand the uh, physics of it. For the last two minutes, if I still have them, I want to show you just a couple of pictures of, of a totally different application. The same method, but in a totally different direction, where uh, we're working with Provina and uh, Chicago looking at biopsies. And probably some of you know, some of you, some of you don't. Once the tissue is removed from the body, the way the biopsy is done, uh, is by basically fixing it, embedded in paraffin, putting it in a machine that is able to slice it very thin, like four microns thick. And there is a requirement during surgery to have a, a biopsy extracted to tell, for example, how much I need, the surgeon needs to remove. In that case, there is no time to do this fixation procedure. The <coughs> tissue is frozen and then sliced. The quality here is a lot worse than in here because the tissue is not fixed nicely, it's not sliced nicely. But here, the speed. The answer has, by law, the answer from the pathologist to the upstairs in the uh, surgery room has to be within 20 minutes from removing out the tissue. So this is speed, this is quality. Altogether, nothing changed in about 100 years with this procedure. After it gets sliced, it goes to staining. This is H&E staining, with, uh, which is the most common one. So we're focusing on prostate for now, and several others, but most of our images are on prostate. So sometimes this, uh, uh, basically the idea is that the tissue is very transparent, it like the cell, so you see nothing if you don't stain it. This is the image that the pathologist looks like first, uh, looks at first, and sometimes they, they cannot get the answer, and they have to do more complicated stains that tell all the story. And my first question, common sense, I thought is, why don't you do this to begin with? Why do you bother with that? And there is an economic aspect to the whole thing, is that this is $10, and this is $700. So we have to be now aware of all these other constraints that usually in the lab we don't really care about. So you need to cover this biopsy, which in this case is about my thumb, one centimeter square, with high resolution images of slim. And actually, it, it turns out that you need to combine thousands of them. And we are actually able to do that. Well, I, I cut through all the, the pain and effort, but uh, we're pretty, pretty good at it now. And as you know, there are commercial instruments that do tissue scanning effortlessly of the colored tissue, of the stained tissue. So technologically, I, I'm optimistic that that shouldn't be an issue. And here's uh, some of our results. First of all, this is the H&E. This is what the doctor said the tumor was. So here's tumor in red. Here's normal tissue in green. Can you see any difference? This is the first, we thought this is the first baby step because we didn't know what to expect. And we did something kind of the simplest thing you could think of was to measure average of the phase and then standard deviation, and maybe kurtosis, all these moments, right? How, how would you start? We, we didn't know how to start. If you look at something like the variance, just the variance of this slim image, calculated over windows that are about cell size, 15 microns or so, this is what you get. So what do you notice? Without being a pathologist, you can tell this is darker than this one, right? this whole part here. So it turns out what we found is that, at least in this initial set of biopsies, we measured just 12 of them in the beginning for our first kind of proof of principle. You can tell cancer from no cancer with 100% uh, 
sensitivity and specificity. But those are very clear cancers, like very like advanced. And, but still, we're very excited. So basically, what it says is that when the tumor sets in, sets in is actually the tissue is rough. So you have fluctuations in the refractive index, and the tissue is kind of is made of the whole the same stuff as the normal tissue because if you look at the average, there isn't much difference. But the way it's put together is completely different. It's like if somebody hit the wall, it's still bricks and mortar and so on, but it looks different. It's rough. That's kind of my analogy. So this is we plotted various things and we found a combination that separates 100% out of uh, only 12 biopsies with 50 normal and 50 cancers, but still it was very encouraging, encouraging enough to have now a dedicated student, Shamir is right there, who just finished imaging 2,000 biopsies. And uh, we're very optimistic. We've got, uh, in the meantime, we've got a lot more ambitious. Shamir is able to do diagnosis in our slim images. So now these are cores, one millimeter uh, diameter biopsy cores. Cytetica have hundreds, hundreds of them on a piece of glass. These are called pitch microarrays. And this is how they look like. So we take the H&E, &E, and then we take the slim images, so you see the, the correlations. So Shamir can do the diagnosis and tell you the Gleason grading and everything by looking at it. I, I, still learning that. Uh, so for instance, you can tell there's a difference between this and that. So this is when the cancer starts to kind of uh, uh, develop, and this glandular network that looks beautiful in normal tissue now starts to close up. You see this doesn't look as nice. And you see basically that the correspondence with HN is perfect. Uh, so as it goes to higher grades, so that means the tumor becomes <coughs> actually uh, more developed, you, you lose that glandular structure. So basically it's completely messed up, as you can see here. Uh, so these dots correspond nicely. This is a nuclei in the stained images here. The nuclei give us a bump in the refractive index. So that's the reason that we can actually do diagnosis with this label three, just by looking at the refractive index. But uh, I'm going to stop right here. But basically, what we've been doing in the past uh, few months or so is to look at actually a more uh, interesting problem or more challenging problem is to tell who's going to evolve well after surgery. The patients, their prostate was removed, and then the doctors cannot tell who's going to do well and who's going to actually not do well in five years. And putting together all their procedures today, it's only a 50-some percent accuracy that they get in predicting that. And our result, actually analyzing uh, our images, it seems to be a lot better at the 70-some percent, but we're still validating that, so uh, that's the reason I didn't want to show. But the point is that there is a lot of information in these refractive index images that can be exploited. We're just scratching the surface, we think. But now we have the data that uh, we will have in our statistics. We're talking now about thousands of these biopsies that we finished imaging. So we're ready to kind of. Uh, one last thing is uh, to actually do this, uh, calculate all these parameters in real time. That would be nice. Imagine you put a uh, slider, you scan it and uh, use, uh, I don't know, parallel computing to calculate everything fast. So I have a student town who, I don't know if you see it, but uh, we're using a, an algorithm that people are using in the Kinect camera, in the, in the game console. So this is actually an idea that Min me, me Dog has and told me, and first I thought he was crazy, but it turns out actually I love it. You know, the, the Kinect has this depth perception, tells you how your limbs are bending and so on. He says, your problem in diagnosis is about the same. Hmm. It turns out that actually it's very similar, that we have actually depth information in these colors here. You can tell that that's closer to you than that's farther away. So we're adapting the, this face recognition that he's doing in his lab to actually do pattern recognition on the tissue. And uh, we have a student who are, we are co-advising, and he just started in the summer on this. So we're very kind of optimistic. The good thing about that, I don't know if you know this, but the Kinect works at 200 grams a second, does that recognition. So there is, uh, because once you, you did the machine learning, then, then actually the pattern recognition itself is very fast. So we're hoping that we're going to throw a bunch of data at this algorithm. We're going to do the learning, and then the recognition will be actually sustained. So we think there is a chance that there will be one day a real-time scanner that will work with SLIM and give you just where the tumors are and give you predictions of that. And so, so OK. Thank you so much for your attention. So these are, there are such things as coherent fiber bundles made of 30, 60,000 individual fibers, uh, all together one millimeter thick. 
And that would go actually instead of, the idea would be instead of going with a needle and removing tissue from the body, just have a fiber optic and get images as it, as it goes through. That would be perfect, right? So optically, I think we, we've got the design right. At least we haven't tested it, so, and I doesn't like it yet. We'll see. So what, what, what is it? So for in vivo, I think you need to probably go to near infrared. So my proposal was maybe at 800 nanometers. Uh, we have to see. It will be complementary to techniques like OCT, where actually uh, in OCT you get a lot more depth, but not so much information as the cellular structure. It will be exactly kind of complementary. You will see great details in a single cell, but the depth information will be limited. You can even think about the it would be nice to find one cell and do the diagnosis on one cell before you remove all the chances. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker one more time.